have mostly done faith-based organizing um, and work for a volunteer program and um, hope to do more education about community organizing and um, time and race into that. I'm Xavier from Toronto, originally from Quebec. I'm Cindy, any pronouns fine? I came here from Brooklyn, and um, I really like the title of this, and um, I think people don't mind it, and not in that, that people don't pay attention to it, and that it's a really key category, and I'm really glad to go to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got everyone. Did you want oh. to introduce you? Um, my name is Renee. I'm from Toronto, originally from Quebec. And I organize with Don as Illegal Toronto. And I'm interested in looking at how ally work plays into the complexities um, that we see in addressing lateral racism within our group. Alright, cool. So kind of the format of how this is gonna go is I'm gonna start talking more about um, sort of the entomology and history of race as a concept itself, which is kind of my area of expertise. And then we're gonna kind of segue in and Koji will be talking more about um, ally work and solidarity and anti-racist organizing, anti organizing itself. And they'll probably pipe in some too, and then we'll kind of open it up and make it more discussion based. Does that sound good, everyone? Cool. Thanks. I followed all these really funny. <laughs> right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Alright, so this is kind of like a disclaimer. So obviously this presentation is not going to be told 
the whole story of the history of the concept of race. And uh, we've got even an hour and a half now. Uh, there will be on some voices, partially for lack of expertise in some areas, and partially for the sake of time. Um, much of the information I'm presenting, I gleaned from the work of Audrey Smedley, um, primarily from this book, uh, Race in North America, which is fantastic, I highly recommend. Uh, Lady Baker, um, who does a great book called From Savage to Negro, which is about the history of anthropology and the construction of race, and that's anthropology in my field, so it's a book I use a lot. And then um, this presentation actually using a lot of the work and is dedicated to the memory of Joel Olson. Um, primarily an article he has, it's on the web as well, but it's in this Contemporary Anarchist Studies reader here. And let me make sure I get the title of this right. Uh, the title of the article is The Problem with Info Shops and Insurrection, U.S. Anarchism Movement Building and the Racial Order, which I highly recommend. So we're going to go around this wheel here. Uh, and these are all different hubs as I kind of identified them um, for this presentation, and they all kind of tie back into the idea of minding the color gap. So that's the idea here. Where they were from or how they looked. But these structures of oppression were not uh, racial as the modern conception of race was not yet a thing. Uh, the birth of race is found in the history of colonialism, and the relationship between racism and colonialism is paramount. Um, just kind of another, well, I'll be talking mostly about the history of race itself, um, and it is tied into the history of colonialism, but I won't be talking that much about uh, issues of colonialism and indigeneity per se, but uh, JJ over there is going to be doing a presentation at three on colonialism uh, itself, settler colonialism, and that sort of stuff in particular. So, yeah, if that will be the other side of that coin there, mostly. All right. Uh, race is a cosmological ordering system that divides the world's peoples into what are thought to be biologically discrete and exclusive groups. The racial worldview holds that these groups are by nature unequal and can be ranked along a gradient of superiority to inferiority. This worldview is conditioned into individuals early in their lives and becomes bonded to emotions nurtured in childhood. It is structured into the social system in one lineage in a negative sense. Um, so both Raza and race were used early in their histories colloquially to describe a breeding line or stock of animals bred for certain purposes or traits. So uh, for the beginning of the word races, uh, history and entomology, uh, entomology, not entomology, that's insects, um, uh, was referring to, um, you know, mostly you know, livestock and movement. So, uh, the word race was used to talk about, oh, I have this new race of cows which is producing more milk than these others. Um, and then uh, that use of race got picked up uh, during what could be called the age of discovery or the age of exploration um, to describe the new peoples encountered. Um, so uh, the word was picked, Raza was picked up uh, into English language as the word race and then um, English colonialists, when they went out and like encountered new peoples, they used the word race to talk about individual groups. Yeah, I've noticed that people who are racist, like the Minutemen, they want to turn it around to say that they're not racist. It's the people, the uh, illegals are racist. Like they'll use the word La Raza and they'll say it means the race, which it does. But then they'll turn it around to say that they're not racist by calling La Raza racist. <laughs> I've noticed that with people like that. I'll actually be talking a little bit about that in my part of the presentation, this attempt to um, say that, oh, we're not racist, you're racist for hating white people or whatever. Um, this reverse racist argument, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, that argument is a symptom of white supremacy as a structure. Um, and so I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. It's annoying as hell, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the use of you know, other words, uh, other terms such as nation, people, culture, uh, maybe less so ethnicity, were used at that time. So uh, the use of the word race to describe new peoples that were encountered is telling of the ideologies of the explorers themselves. Um, they chose this word that had been primarily used colloquially to talk about animals, to talk about um, 
qualities and attributes of um, livestock and farm animals when talking about people. Um, and it's not, I mean, I don't want to make a, a blanket argument across the board that everyone used the word race when encountering new peoples, but it was one of the words <laughs> that was used very often in this time period. Um, and obviously, uh, due to its history, the term race carries with it denotations of innateness, inheritability, and permanence, unlike some of the other words such as nation or culture. So, you know, the word race carried with it ideas of, you know, um, biological innateness of uh, someone's um, essence in and of itself being tied to their biology. Um, right, and, and to their their capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, you know, this is probably, you know, colloquially used to talk about farm animals, so, you know, uh, this race, as they were using as then, of chickens lays more eggs, and they laid their eggs because they're that race of chicken. Um, and that being tied, brought into this idea of things that, I mean, can't be at all determined biologically, of like, oh, well, they don't understand um, ownership of property, that must be an aspect of their race. Um, like, this must be part of just who they are innately. Um, yeah. so. uh, encounters with the other in the age of exploration is part of the story of the rise of a racial worldview, uh, the transition from feudalism to mercantilism, and the rise of capitalism, and the rise of science are also key factors. Um, mercantilism and capitalism carried with them ideas of the relationship between man, and I'm using the term here deliberately, not as it might have later for any human, and property. Uh, men of substance and civility were men that owned property, and a man without property was essentially a social non-entity. So tied into this was, you know, they're going out, they're encountering new peoples that have completely different um, concepts of, of property and economics. Um, and when they see that, you know, they don't think about ownership or property the same way, um, well, then they must be, you know, less human. Um, and how, you know, in, in a lot of this, so, sorry, especially in the English worldview, if you look at, like, the early antecedents of the kind of more contemporary conception of race, um, earliest, the earlier, uh, like, first group to be um, kind of racialized were the Irish um, in, in the UK, um, where the English were starting to encounter more um, Gaelic peoples that were primarily pastoralists, meaning that they had lived a quasi-nomadic lifestyle, like, with herds of sheep or goats or whatever. Um, and because they didn't... Um, use land in the same way, um, the term, they, they came to be uh, racialized, or uh, they are called savages, um, partially because, you know, they spoke a different language, partially because maybe, you know, typically they often looked different, but uh, a big part of it was their, how they treated property. Um, and that, you know, uh, became part of, like, this innate idea of what it meant to be Irish. And obviously, um, throughout most of the world since then, um, most people of Irish descent have been kind of turned brought into the blanket, the blanket of whiteness. But um, early on, that was kind of like one of the first uh, groups to be racialized in that way. Can, can I make a comment on that? Yeah. Well, um, it's also important to note that this issue of land usage is part of what determines, you know, your class or caste or race, particularly here. And so I just wanted to go back to what your speaker what was your name again? Khalil. Khalil. I want to go back to what Khalil was talking about with the Minutemen. Um, a lot of the Minutemen will say, oh, you know, we're not racist, we don't mind Americans, we don't mind African Americans, so on and so forth. But this idea that, like, um, physical space, where one is born, determines their race. This idea that, you know, you were born on this side of the border, so therefore you are unlike me who was born on this side of the border. Um, this idea of, like, land usage, um, it, really does inform the modern conception of, of race and uh, I guess xenophobia definitely linked with it. I mean they're not necessarily one and the same but there is a relationship there that needs to be confronted as well. And capitalism too. And capitalism as well. Because 
because what they do is they make it impossible for people to do it legally, and some people don't care. And it's basically, if you're rich, you can come here, and if you're poor, you better be white. If you're poor and you're not white, stay on the other side of the border. Exactly. So along with um, the sort of rise of capitalism and the age of expiration, which basically means colonialism, um, came a, a rise of science, um, particularly in the, the mid 17th and 16th, well, late 16th, mid 17th century. Uh, and with the rise of science came a rise in what um, were called rational systematic explanations for the world. Um, and bad science helped spread the ideas of race and, of course, showed how it was a fact uh, that the colonizer was superior to the colonized. So, you know, um, people started to back up these arguments of, well, you know, slavery is okay because biologically, you know, we have these capabilities that these other people don't have, and therefore that puts us in the right. Um, so, you know, science was really explicitly, like, both, especially biologic, biology and anthropology were used as um, kind of a cornerstone um, to, um, to rationalize and try to legitimize people's uh, feelings around race. Um, and, you know, all these, I wish I, I have some visuals, I didn't put them in this presentation, but you know, the, these, uh, um, you know, like trees of the, the peoples, the races of mankind, mm -hmm. uh, and these like hierarchical orders, um, putting, you know, uh, East Africans here and West Africans here and um, people of Baltic descent here and trying to like decide who's highest on the hierarchy. And of course the highest is always, you know, Protestant white males um, generally. Uh, so, yeah. All right, and then when the racial uh, the racial worldview that comes to dominate um, the 17th century and arguably up and up until now um, really starts to develop during the slave trade. Um, the first African slaves arrived in Jamestown in 1619. Uh, the English who uh, were new to African slavery, but were quickly becoming the largest slavers, uh, spread the scientific narrative of African peoples as a race. Um, so this is pretty interesting um, because, so the conception of race that um, became kind of a global phenomena really comes out of an English narrative. Um, so for instance, the Portuguese uh, were had extensive, complicated relations uh, with um, West Africa, like as early as the 1440s, um, and you know there was slave trade going on, but it was the the slaves weren't seen as a separate race. It was just uh, slavery, more in like a Aristotelian sense, like the slavery of ancient Greece, um, where you know. Uh, no, they're their slaves, their property, but it wasn't necessarily tied to their uh, their phenotype, how they looked, or that the fact they were from West Africa. Um, but once the English start coming, taking over, and doing these scientific narratives about race, um, the rest of the world, the Portuguese, the Spanish, etc., start adopting uh, that racial worldview that becomes so. Uh, Luis, you want to? Yeah. yeah, and and also like the, the, there's a difference too in that then it was like the slavery was even regulated by African states, <laughs> like the, and it wasn't so much based on like raids and um, and attacks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the not to point a finger, but yeah, the so the English kind of take over the slave trade, um, become the biggest members of it, um, have this. Uh, these scientific narratives that are coming out about you know these ideas of race, a lot of it building on the relation between uh, the English and they're already they're already to racialize the Irish, um, and kind of taking that same framework and applying it to African peoples, um, and that through you know kind of maybe one of the one of the earliest like pitfalls of globalization becoming a racial a worldview, an idea that um, pretty much all of the world starts to hold 
about um, about uh, race itself. All right. Um, so that's a little bit of history, um, mostly early stuff. Uh, so I'm going to move on to um, what Joel Olson laid out as three principles for an anarchist theory of race. Um, and I'll go through these three. Um, principle number one. Uh, that politics is fundamentally a struggle for hegemony, or as Antonio Gramsci put it, the struggle to define the common sense of a society. Um, and I think this one uh, is particularly important because race is thought of as a common sense sort of thing. Um, people all over the world are raised to believe that, you know, races exist, uh, you know, everyone's of a race. Um, and that it you know, becomes part of their common sense ideology or cosmology or worldview, however you want to put it. That you know, these are facts about the world, how things are actually structured. Um, and that uh, politics in and of itself is fundamentally trying to change how people have their common sense viewpoints. All right, uh, number two, uh, that white supremacy is the central means of maintaining, maintaining capitalist hegemony in the United States. Um, I mean, obviously, the economic wealth of this country is, was built in slavery, um, absolutely. Um, and that, uh, I don't want to get too far into this, but a great thing to read is uh, W.E.D. Du Bois. Du Bois um, did a, a number of articles about what he called the wages of whiteness, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, this I idea that, so even the proletarian or working class, uh, whatever you want to call it, white folk, um, were made to feel superior above black folk in a very um, strategic way by the capitalist, to, to feel uh, part of some sort of a you know, manifest destiny, American dream sort of narrative, um, and that that narrative itself was built on uh, uh, racism and white supremacy, and that that's kind of uh, the foundation of uh, which um, industrial labor was built on this country is around those issues. Uh, and number three, uh, that building mass movements against white supremacy is the central means by which a new hegemony, a anarchist common sense, if you will, uh, can be created. Um, so. The call was that we need to learn the history of any given area in order to change it, and to look at the struggles and triumphs of peoples of colors in our own peoples of color in our own backyard. Uh, many anarchists can wax poetic on 1968 of the Spanish Revolution, but little attention seems to be played to black freedom struggles, for instance, and that we need to expand our areas of expertise. Um, and with that, I'm gonna shift over to to come to. Okay. Um, for my portion of this, I don't actually need the. Uh, um, the projector. Is there a way we can turn it off? Well, I am. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm glad you actually put intersectionality in there because that was something I wanted to get to. Yeah, so I'll just leave it on this for a while. I have, I have homework at the end, so we're going to wait for that slide. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, well, I have notes on there. I need to be. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to turn it off? Um, yeah, go ahead and turn it off. We can turn it back on. Yeah. Can I ask a question right now? Yeah. Um, LAPD. How much like racism does exist now on the force? Because I heard that since Chief Bratton came on that force, that they cleaned it up. I, I, I don't know. I'm not. I don't have a lot of strong ties to California or the West Coast in general. So I, I mean, I don't. I don't know the particular struggles. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure DC might have a lot, but then it's like maybe a little less than uh, maybe in New York City mm -hmm. because it's more people of color there. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you, you had something to say? Maybe when we move to the more discussion part, people from those individual cities might have stuff to eliminate. Like, I know about what's going on in South Florida and Sarasota, but... I mean, my advice is if the cops ever say that they, you know, are doing something, ask them to prove it, you know. Um, always be skeptical. So I was watching Boys in the Hood, and I saw something that was pretty disturbing. The movie? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs>
portion of this is, I'm glad I see a lot of you taking notes. I would have printed out some uh, some handouts, but I, I kind of felt fine by seeing my pants a little bit here, so I appreciate you guys bearing with me if you can. Um, I just want to preface this first by saying that like, I'm not necessarily an expert on this, which is why I want it to be a little bit more um, discussion-based and participatory. I think all of us have different um, experience organizing, and so I kind of want people to share their perspectives on a lot of these things. Um, but what I have done here is I've taken a lot of information that I've collected over the years. Um, a lot of this is directly lifted from Chris Crass, who's a really awesome um, white anti-racist organizer. Um, and a lot of it is uh, from material that either was uh, a precedent to the Anne Braden program or straight up from the Anne Braden program, which is a really great anti-racist training organization out in the Bay. Um, I have actually never done it, but I know lots of people who have. And uh, so by their recommendation, I would definitely look into it. Um, so yeah, if you end up doing that, that program and you hear a lot of the things I said today, that's why. I totally ripped them off. Um, so first I want to um, talk a little bit about this concept of white supremacy um, and what that means. Um, so white supremacy has two sides to it. Um, one is the racial oppression that affects people of color. Um, the, when we talk about institutionalized racism and we talk about police brutality and things of that nature, that's the way in which um, uh, white supremacy affects people of color. The other side of it is white privilege. And that's the way white supremacy affects white people. And uh, this tends to be the fact that there are huge differentials in access to health care, uh, education, the way laws are enforced, and so on and so forth, that privileges um, white people above people of color. Um, so it's making that, that racist idea that James was talking about, this hierarchy of races, and it's making it true. Um, not true in a biological sense, but true in like an observable sense that white people have greater access to these things, and um, people of color don't have as much access to these things. Um, so it's ensuring that this racial supremacy, this racial order, um, maintains itself. Um, and what that does is it really does affect the way we think. So white supremacy doesn't require a conscious decision to think racist thoughts, because what it is, is it's the structure that creates our thoughts. And this is um, what James was talking about, this assumed common sense that, like, oh, race exists. You know, the very fact that this is a common sense thing is a symptom of white supremacy. It's a product of this structure. So one of the questions I want to ask is, what is a racist? And a lot of times when you ask people that question, they automatically think of a neo-Nazi or a Ku Klux Klan member, or someone with a little bit more of a nuanced view might think of a, a Minuteman, right? Um, but really, a race, it, the, the definition that I took from, from a lot of my reading here um, and, and activism is, a racist is one who is both privileged and socialized on the basis of race by a white supremacist racist society. And that, that is oftentimes a really difficult thing for people to confront because what that means is that if you were raised in a white supremacist society, you are a racist. And that's really hard for people to hear because people are, are always saying, I'm not a racist, I'm not, yeah. Could you read that definition again? Sure. Yeah. A racist is one who is both privileged and socialized on the basis of race by a white supremacist racist system. So a racist is someone who accepts that, you know, race is common sense, you know, and we are all raised that way. I was actually reading an article unrelated to, to my activism that said that babies by the time they're three years old um, are already recognizing racial difference. And that's scary, to think that like by three years old, this white supremacist ideology is already ingrained in children. And this, th this is among white babies, Latino babies, African American babies, so on and so forth, that all children, by the time they're three years old, are starting to see racial difference. Um, so, I mean, that's just to demonstrate like the sheer pervasiveness of this like white supremacist ideology and this white supremacist way of thinking. Um, so, if we are all racists as being the product of a racist society, how can we be anti-racist racists, <laughs> right? Uh, it sounds, sounds like a contradiction, and it is a contradiction. Um, but it's important to recognize that when doing 
any anti-racist organizing, you're going to be faced with contradictions, and you're going to be faced with really difficult situations. And um, I think people's first reaction when faced with those kinds of things is to run away from it, hide from it, stick our head in the sand, ignore it. I think that's counterproductive. And I would suggest to anyone, anytime you're in um, a racially uncomfortable or racially charged situation, to face it head on and, and do so humbly. Not, you know, with this arrogance and defensiveness, but in a, how can we move past this? How can we understand this? How can we pick this situation apart? I'll get into a little bit more details and skills that we can do to do that. So it's one thing to say, like, do this, and it's another thing to actually do it. So we're, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so anti-racism means actively confronting and opposing white supremacy. And uh, since white people benefit from white supremacy, um, we must both confront institutions, but we must also confront ourselves, our own um, ideologies and, and ideas as well as those of our community. So it's important to hold ourselves and the people we love accountable um, for those ideologies, to constantly confront that. Um, so this next section is something that's actually original, but highly um, inspired by the work of Chris Kraft. Um, what I have done is, in somewhat of a medical fashion, um, describe the symptoms of a sick society uh, diagnosed with white supremacy. So, um, the first symptom uh, is color blindness, right? Um, this idea, uh, an aspect of color blindness is um, default whiteness, the assumption that like the white lens is universal, that if you see the world through a white lens, that's how the world actually is. Um, and that's really hard to get over, you know? Uh, one, of, one of the quotes I found I thought was really funny was, um, the books I read are written by white people because that's who writes, and that's not my fault. <laughs> I mean, that's a really funny thing to hear, right? I mean, it's absurd, right? The idea that like only white people write, but unfortunately, um, with the way like the education system is, you know, it's not unusual that people haven't read any books by women or people of color until they get to college, and even then, only if they take a class on like diversity or something. I mean, when you get to college, you take. Uh, Western civilization or Western philosophy, never once realizing that there's like an entire world outside of Europe that has been creating knowledges and perspectives for years and years and years. Um, but one of the pitfalls that we have as activists, um, is, and I think this speaks especially to the anarchist community, but uh, you know other communities as well. All the activists I know are white because that's who organizes demonstrations and actions, and that's not my fault. That's something that we have to get out. Of. You know. Um, one, I think it's a, a false narrative. I, I'm skeptical of the idea that anarchism is like an explicitly or even dominantly white space. I think the problem is, is that it's a space in which white voices dominate the conversation. And so we think that anarchism is a white space. So one, um, I think we need to deconstruct that. But two, I think it's important to build alliances with communities of color that have their own causes and their own um, organizations and demonstrations and actions, and it's important to act in solidarity with them. Um, someone who's been uh, diagnosed with colorblindness thinks that race is an individualized issue, and they think that racism is being mean. It's, it's when you're mean to someone. Don't, don't be mean to them. They can't help that they're black. Like That's, an, again, an absurd sort of, <laughs> sort of uh, comment, but it's really common to people who are diagnosed with colorblindness. Um, the other, the other um, uh, vision problem that we're diagnosed with in a white supremacist society is black and white vision. And uh, this manifests itself in, in different ways. Um, sometimes it means noticing racism for the first time. And sometimes it means uh, noticing our prejudices for the first time. Or developing those prejudices. Um, so it's, it's people who, who say these things, or, or people who are diagnosed with this, oftentimes have really, really shallow analyses of race. It basically means that you've gone to like a Dane Cook show and you walk away thinking that you understand race, you know? Uh, like a comedian gets up there and goes, you ever notice how black people say ax instead of ask? That is a black and white vision joke. That means that you don't understand anything deeper than like, these people are different than me. That's really shallow, that's really scary, that's a really dangerous um, mentality to have. So that's something else we have to get away from. Um, 
Um, and, and this is all symptoms of being raised in a white supremacist society. So you'll see people who aren't even uh, white saying these things as well. Um, the next is, is the equality police, okay? These are people who say things like, can't we all just get past our differences? <laughs> First you have to recognize differences, you know? Um, these people still think that racism is individualized. Um, Khalil pointed out this idea of reverse racism. These people buy into reverse racism. They, they buy into this idea of um, false equivalencies, you know, because they don't yet see racism as a structure. They still see it as a highly individualized situation, and they see it as racism is being mean to someone. Um, they don't understand it in terms of a structural issue um, that affects everyone. Um, these people say that, like, oh, this black guy was mean to me, and it has to do with the fact that they were black. And it's like, no, no. Did you ever think maybe that this person identifies you as a member of uh, a dominant caste, class, or in this particular case, race? Um, and that's a really difficult thing for people to confront. They don't like to think of themselves as being privileged. But it's one of the first things that we need to do before we can work past um, this structure and, and work to deconstruct it. Um, the next one I want to talk about is white guilt. This one is also really dangerous, I think. Um, people who are suffering from white guilt tend to see and understand racism as a systemic issue for the first time. Um, this is a really, I think in a lot of ways, traumatic thing for white people to work through. Um, it's difficult to confront your own privilege. Everyone, everyone has difficulty with it. It's not an easy thing to do. It's something that people are going to work through their entire lives. So I think it's ridiculous to expect that someone in an afternoon is going to get past it. But white guilt is also really dangerous because um, the mentality behind uh, white guilt is, I hate racism because it makes me feel bad. You know, it, and, and what that fails to do is that fails to recognize how racism affects people of color. And, and that fails to, again, recognize um, the, the really, truly dangerous aspects of a white supremacist society. And so um, I think it tends to paralyze people. You know, people think like, oh, I'm white, I benefit from privilege, therefore there's nothing I can do. It's not the case, you know. That's a really dangerous thing to do because what that does is it stops you from deconstructing white supremacy. Um, so white guilt is also not productive as, at all. Um, the next term I have is, is uh, or the next diagnosis I have is going native. And by the way, <laughs> just, just a preface, uh, you know, preface. Going native is totally a racist term, okay? <laughs> so don't for a moment think that, like, that's appropriate. I'm using that term somewhat tongue-in-cheek, so I apologize if that's not communicated. I want to be explicit about that. When I say going racist, I, going native, I don't mean it. When I say going native, I don't mean it in, in a racist way. I mean it to kind of poke fun at, at, at racism. Um, but people who are suffering from going native, um, they acknowledge racism. They oppose racism, they see it as a systemic issue, and they want to kill whitey, you know? That, that's like one of the things that you see. Um, you can spot these people, they have an over-identification with people of color, and this is an attempt on their part to absolve themselves from their whiteness and white privilege. And one of the things that you'll hear, hear them say is, I'm not like those white people. And that's also a really dangerous mentality to have, and I'll get into that a little bit later, um, why that's counterproductive. Um, but this is where you'll see a lot of cultural appropriation. You'll see Bonnaroo headdresses. Um, you'll you'll see them. You'll, you'll hear them say things like, "I have black friends." You know? Um, have you have you guys ever seen the movie Car Wash? Uh, no. Okay. Car Wash is this really stupid comedy from the seventies. But <laughs> there's this one character in Car Wash that I love because I think he's hilarious. The the premise of Car Wash is there's this white guy who owns a car wash and the majority of his workers are African American, and it, um, I think Richard Pryor is in it, and it's mm -hmm. just, it's a really like wild movie. But um, the car wash owner's son is like this young radical in the 70s who like carries around Mao's Red Book, and he's trying to organize the workers, and you know, he thinks of himself as like African American. He has like an Afro, and it's really funny, and all the other uh, African American workers at the, at the car wash kind of like laugh at him behind his back because he's like taken on this like black power stance, and um, so I think he is kind of this archetype of, of the going native um, uh, symptom. Uh, and the really dangerous thing about going native is you can go ahead and do that, you know, feel free, feel free, but you're not escaping your privilege, and you're not doing anything, 
and that's why it's really you're not doing anything to deconstruct white supremacy, and that's why white supremacy is so dangerous. It's because it's so pervasive that if you're not constantly confronting it on a structural basis, um, then you're really not necessarily doing any good. I mean, it's wonderful that you've worked past these things personally, but the point is to deconstruct white supremacy as a structure, as a system. Um, so the next part, I, I kind of broke it up into two sections. One, I wanted to talk about addressing racism within the anarchist milieu and the anarchist movement. And then the next is building coalitions with um, people and, and movements of color. Um, so first, I think anarchists need to acknowledge that white guilt isn't helpful. Um, white guilt causes paralysis, um, and, uh, and it, f it focuses on us and not people of color, the, the real victims of white supremacy. Um, it's also not about adding a few faces of color to our group. We're not a corporation trying to demonstrate our dedication to diversity. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they have like bus ads for those corporate online universities that always show like a black nurse going like this. <laughs> like, we're not trying to do that. That's tokenizing. Yeah, I know. Oh, sorry. About no, that. go ahead. Um, I've seen uh, a commercial, it was like a national commercial for Future of American Workers, and they've used black people, and I've also seen this group called uh, National Organization for Marriage, and they tokenize black people. It's not a racist group, it's a homophobic group, but it, they tokenize African Americans to say this affects all races. But you know, you say it's not a racist group. I would counter that maybe it is, because what they're doing is they're trying to pit African Americans against the gay community without acknowledging the existence of gay African Americans. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Pitting these two things as opposites ignores that intersectionality, which is really important to fighting white supremacy. They, they are basically come to places like D.C. and they're not really welcome there. D.C., New York, or Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They're not welcome there, but there's a few African Americans there. Yeah. I, I think Nicole actually used the word intersectionality, so I wanted to thank you for that, because that's really important to, to fighting white supremacy, is acknowledging that white supremacy affects women, it affects um, uh, uh, queer people, it affects non-heteronormative people, um, and this attempt to blanket and, and erase those voices is a part of white supremacy, this attempt to view the world through this very narrow white man's lens. Um, so it's important to recognize how these things interact. Um, it, that's part of deconstructing the logic and narrative of white supremacy. Um, so. What I mean by we're not just trying to add a few faces of color to our group is what we actually want to do is um, really create a space where people of color um, are contributing and are valued members of our anarchist and organizing attempts. Um, so some of the ways that we can do that is one, by checking our privilege. Um, so here's a checklist of things that you can do next time you're in an organizing meeting. One. Take note of how often you speak when you're planning and organizing meetings. Just be aware of, of your own participation, especially if you're a white man. Um, take note of how others speak and racialize that data. Like, take note of how, how often um, Latino women speak, how often uh, disabled Native Americans speak, so on and so forth. You want to be aware of whose voices are being heard and whose voices are being recognized. Um, be conscious of when you're actively listening and when you're just waiting to speak again. Because these are very different things. Um, it's very important to, to take note of what other people are saying and not just constantly be trying to, to sway the arguments. Um, and this is one that, that I actually do all the time, partly because I'm shy and partly because I think it's a really good thing to do. Next time you're in a meeting, don't speak at all. Just listen and pay attention to the racial dynamics of the group. Just observe. Um, obviously take notes on what's being said, but you should racialize the data of what you observe within the group dynamics. Um, uh, count how, how often you propose ideas and how often you support ideas proposed by others. And again, take note of how many of those ideas were proposed by people of color, women, and uh, so on and so forth. Even the young. Oh yeah, definitely pay attention like to ages. And, yeah. yeah. Um, especially, you know, the elderly tend to be left out of anarchist groups because, you know, it tends to be like younger punk rock kids, yeah. and that's fine, but, you know, um, we got older comrades who've been doing this for a long time, and they got a lot of wisdom that we can learn from. Yeah, you've got young, like, even kids and old people. Yeah. Both, both age groups. I'm not talking about teenagers, I'm talking about, like, children, like, right? Yeah. Yeah. And older people, like elderly people and children both together. Yeah. 
yeah, definitely you know, wisdom often comes from the mouth of babes, right? So, um, uh, let me see. Observe whose work and contributions to the group gets recognized, and uh, practice recognizing the work of others. So if you see that someone is doing a lot of work but, but isn't being recognized for it, go out of your way to bring that to, a, to the group's attention. Um, and also, ask people of color what they thought during the meetings and uh, about ideas and actions and strategies. This is both really important for building strong interpersonal skills. Like a white anarchist milieu tends to hang out with each other, and so they know each other really well, and they get to know these ideas in, in a less formal setting. So it's important to do that as well with your, with your comrades of color so that you um, build those personal ties and they feel a, a greater sense of, of inclusion in that group. Um, and their voices will be heard and resonate a little bit more. Um, we also need to address our language. And I mean this um, in, in many terms. Um, one, you know, sort of mainstream phraseology. Uh, the, the language of white supremacy that seep, seeps into everything. Um, phrases like white lie, you know, yeah. ask, ask the average person on the street what a white lie is, and they're like, oh, a white lie is a lie that doesn't hurt anyone. But if you ask a Native American person what a white lie is, they're like, everything that's ever come from a white man's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it's really important to recognize the logic behind these phrases is not, is not always uh, another one. Indian giver, right? Uh, James was talking about... Um, how we use land, right? And the, the idea that Native Americans, they don't understand, they don't understand how private property works. Um, and, and that that's linked to something to do with their race. Indian giver is a phrase that reflects that ideology. And it, it's a really disgusting and sick phrase to use, but it's one that no one really thinks about. Um, we've, we were taught that Columbus discovered America. Right. I love that one because like to, to discover something means that like no one knew it was there to begin with. So that like completely erases all like in, indigenous history, right? They, they had no, they didn't exist before Columbus showed up. Um, old world versus new world. This is another one. Like the phrase the new world again implies that like there was no history before Europeans showed up. Um, underdeveloped nations is another one. Slaves were brought to America. This really ignores like the violence that was, you know, chattel slavery. Um, I'm trying to think of some more. Does anyone else have any others? Say, what's that? Gyp. Gyp. That's a good one. That's a good one, right? Because that one's referencing, you know, gypsies, right? And how they got gypped on something. Again, mm. this idea that they don't understand how private property works. I'll bring something up later. I'll let someone else speak. There you go. <laughs> Picnic? Yeah, it would be like you know, right. It would be a, a lynching, basically. Oh shit! I didn't even know that one. That's mm -hmm. disgusting. There's some there's some controversy out on that. There's, there's some research, and since that has become a hot topic in the past couple of years, that's just starting to do some reading on it. Because a lot of these, unfortunately, the historiography on a couple of things tends to slip, and so I'm trying to get back in that word. So. Be careful with that one. That may not be an absolute example. It has, it okay. has de facto become an example of a picnic thing in at least the African American community. But the real historiography on it shows that it may have actually even predated what we're talking about. So just be careful. It's like the Willie Lynch letter. The Willie Lynch letter, if any of you read, familiar with the letter about um, slave masters and advice on how to break slaves mentality and what have you and um, so it's really referenced and, and looked at as, as an example the actual historiography on it probably was not it doesn't look like it was an absolutely real letter however at the time period however whoever wrote it as an example did put some principles that we need to look at but the actual historiography on it's kind of tricky picnic is one of those things but yeah. so hmm. be careful on that does anyone have any others 99 percent 99%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that one really blankets over. The interesting thing about that one is no one really cared about subprime mortgages when it only aff affected the African American community. It was as soon as it affected the white community that it became, oh, we're the 99%. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> um, anyone else have any others? But I mean, they're, they're countless. I mean, it's just 
expressed in our language. So one, I think it's important to to know that, if, if for no other reason than to confront that logic um, that's that's even in our language. Well, just like another, sorry, I just want to throw another example out there. It's, uh, something uh, like even, you know, some of our football teams with the Redskins. That's oh, yeah. a big one that, like, you know, that's just something that people are raised to think, oh, okay, that's just a football team. But the name itself is just, um, you know, completely derogatory. So it's, and it, but it's something that's just been accepted and acculturated over time as just, you know, this it's a football team. Yeah. Founding fathers. Founding fathers. Yeah, whose fathers, right? <laughs> <laughs> whose fathers? <laughs> My daddy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Damn. I actually have another question that might take in a different direction, so I don't want to interrupt. Um, but uh, I was taking notes on your ideas about being conscious about race during uh, activist meetings, um, and you proposed certain ideas, but I feel but I felt as though those ideas assumed that there was already racial diversity in those who were meeting. Mm -hmm. um, how does a group go from being an exclusively white group to uh, you know, racially diverse group uh, that is truly um, affirming and inclusive without tokenizing and without those other things. Yeah. I'm actually going to get to that right after I finish this section on language. Okay. Um, it's about building alliances with, with other movements. Okay. So, uh, but I, I, I am going to get to that. So, the next thing I want to talk about within, like, the, the I'll, I'll gloss over this one real quick because I really do want to get to that point. It's a very good point. Um, the language of anarchist culture and anarchist movements can oftentimes be alienating um, to people who aren't really necessarily familiar with our, our theory and, and the history of anarchism and so on and so forth. You'll go to a meeting and someone will rattle on about you know Proudhon for like a half hour. And, I mean, honestly, no one cares. Right? I don't know what that is. <laughs> exactly. Well, Proudhon was um, a French uh, anarchist who, I guess, famously coined the phrase uh, "property is theft." Um, and and that's just an example of like something that in my opinion, is obscure and not really necessarily important to the movement um, at, at hand. Like, we've all, like, approached anti-capitalism and we're all working on different things. Um, and because a lot, of, a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with that, that information, I don't think it's always useful to, to reference it. But if you're in a situation where you do have to reference it, I think it's important to, to explain it. It's not that people aren't going to understand, it just is that they're they're not familiar with it. So it's important to be inclusive and explain things to people who, who and to have that patience to explain things that people don't necessarily understand um, or, or aren't familiar with. Um, I hope I didn't gloss over Proudhon too, too quickly. I just, like, I just don't think it's that important, you know, especially to movement building. But um, there's, there's like good literature out there um, about him and his kind of critique of capitalism. I, a lot of people don't know that Proudhon was like extremely anti-woman and in some ways like racist. And while I don't think it's important to necessarily like know about him, a lot of anarchist theory is based off of an anti-feminist, racist guy. Yeah. And how that like pulls out for especially like white anarchists, like the way that we behave, because it is so entrenched in our in our upbringing, basically. I think it's really interesting that you bring up that point too, because James was talking about this idea of like scientific racism, the idea that, that racism was understood as like um, a fact of science. This is the world that you know Proudhon and these other white anarchists were coming from. So while they do offer some valuable um, insight into the nature of capitalism and whatnot, they're consistently going to fail when it comes to talking about race. And so if we as an anarchist movement um, want to uh, to get past that, we can't keep dawdling on these writings by like dead white men from Europe. You know, we, we have to, to engage with um, contemporary theorists, we have to engage with people of color, and we have to include those perspectives to really enrich our movement. Because we can't envision an anti-capitalist future without people of color. It's just, that does not make sense. Um, and so that's why it's so important to build alliances with um, people of color and communities of color and other movements that are predominantly um, uh, run by people of color, um, or led by people of color. Um, and the first aspect of that is accepting the leadership of people of color. And this is oftentimes really difficult for people who um, are coming from the anarchist perspective because we're, we're taught that we're all leaders, you know, um, that we all have opportunities to take the lead and take charge. And I think that's really good. I think leadership skills are important for everyone. But at the same time, 
we need to recognize that when we're working with communities of color, this is their struggle. And you're just there to help in any way that they say that you can help. So um, we have to get past our own arrogance about the roles that we play. Um, and we need to accept that when it comes to movements of color and people of color and their movements, we need to ask them, how can we help? How, how can we be of assistance to you in achieving your goals and your agenda? Um, so we need to, uh, um, and one of the things that, that really upsets anarchists I've noticed is like when, when it comes to tactics. Um, you know, anarchist tactics tend to be, we're going out on the streets and we're going to fight the cops. Or uh, we're going out on the streets and we're going to do some property damage and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, direct action and whatnot. I think that that's important. I think that those tactics can be useful um, if done and planned correctly. However, we also need to recognize that those, those actions have different consequences for people of color. Um, we all know that the injustice system, not justice, injustice system, has differential jail sentences for people of color than for white people. People of color in, in riot situations become targets for police, um, partly because they stand out and partly because the, the justice system already has, or injustice system already has a prejudice against them. So we need to recognize that those tactics aren't always going to be useful for a movement um, of predominantly people of color. And that doesn't mean that their, their movements aren't radical. You know, we can't say like, oh, it's not radical enough for me. Like the truly radical thing is being open-minded about what other tactics can we use to achieve similar or the same goals. Um, so uh, communities of color often have their own equally effective means of resistance with um, a proven historical record. Um, I don't really think citizen review boards for police accountability work, but sometimes they do. Um, there is some value in that. Um, I think that's real democracy in action, um, or sometimes it's real democracy in action. Uh, occupying ancestral lands, um, challenging multinational polluters like in Bhopal, India, that was like a, a big issue. Um, just because they're not rioting you know, and fighting police in the streets doesn't mean that it's not radical. And we need to, to recognize that and incorporate those tactics um, and, and support those tactics. Another thing to recognize is that white privilege is a resource. And I know that sounds really bizarre and counterintuitive, but White privilege gives you access to spaces and resources that aren't always available to communities and people of color. Um, so it's always important to, to go to this group um, that's, that's planning some sort of action in your community or that you've heard about. Um, it's very important to pay attention, you know, not just to only look at anarchist actions, but to also look at um, immigrants' rights actions or anti-police brutality actions and so on and so forth and get involved in those. And when we do that, say, here is what I you know, I have these connections, this is what I'm good at, how can I be of, of use? Um, and, and so, with your white privilege, you might um, have someone who has some, you might yourself or know someone who has some legal expertise that could help. Or um, you might have uh, access to medical care or, or medical care professionals that might be able to help. Or um, politicians, if you're trying to get some sort of uh, legislation passed or blocked or something like that. Those are important things, things to do. Those are important resources to bring to those communities. But I think the most important thing that, that um, white folks can do for communities of color and people of color is um, you have access to white ears and white spaces. And so it's not the job of people of color to educate white people of racism. It's your job as white people. It's our job as white people to go out and educate your communities and, and teach them what, you, what you've learned and how to deconstruct white supremacy and to confront white supremacy, to, con to confront that logic and uh, deconstruct it and fight it every day, um, to organize our own communities against racism. And this goes back to what I was talking about within our own anarchist milieu, to say to, the, to, to, say to our comrades, this is a way that we can make this space more open and considered for people of color where their voices are actually valued and they're not just a snapshot for a diversity photograph, you know. Um, and it's important to really do that, to confront our own um, ideas about race, to create a space where people of color are, are um, included and valued. Um, and, uh, you know, the other unfortunate truth is that because of white supremacy, sometimes white folks are just more open to learning about racism from other white people. Um, I, I don't know if you guys know Tim Wise, but Tim Wise is this really yeah. awesome... Um, uh, anti-racist activist, white guy. But, I mean, 
he looks like he could fit in at the Republican National Convention. <laughs> yeah. He wouldn't, he wouldn't but, but he looks like he could. And because of that, you know, he travels all around the country speaking to universities, and because of that, you've got these like young Republicans who are now listening to him and thinking, like, maybe there's something to this. I mean, I'm sure it doesn't work every time, but, yeah. Um, That's I had, funny. Peggy McIntosh came to Baltimore recently. She's another white anti-racist um, author, and she said the same thing, that, like, a symptom of white supremacy is that I will get heard and listened to as a white person talking about white privilege as opposed to people of color. Peggy McIntosh is great. She has a, what's that art? I'm happy we just will knapsack If you guys Google that, it's awesome. It will really open your eyes to a lot of like the, the things about what. But it's interesting that you bring her up because she came to speak at my undergraduate school, and I, I brought one of my white friends um, to see to hear her speak, and he had like a really emotionally tumultuous sort of moment after that. Like he was mad at me for bringing him first of all, <laughs> um, but he was really mad at having to confront like. That white privilege. So yeah, she's a really great and effective activist who writes really well. She understands the intersectionality between like feminism and anti-racism. Really bad. Thank you so much for bringing her up. I totally would have forgotten about her otherwise. So, uh, but she's a really great um, author to read. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, solidarity and what solidarity means. Um, I, you know, I define solidarity as an act of um, bonding politically and spiritually with people struggling for their own liberation. I know spiritually is sometimes a contentious word for the anarchist community, which is oftentimes atheists and whatnot, but I think that there is something like truly transcendent about making someone else's struggle valuable or, or important to yourself, like to recognizing that, because you're bridging this just huge gap between people. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, to recognize that transcendent quality of, of solidarity. Um, solidarity is not charity. Um, that's really important. It's, it's not useful to say, like, oh, I'm doing this for them because they need it. Um, solidarity is not an act of surrender or subordination to the liberation fighters either. It's not saying, like, oh, you know, they can do whatever they want or whatever. Um, and it's not simply acting as an ally. I want to differentiate between an act of solidarity and an act of allyship. Um, being an ally is an individual relationship between two people, whereas solidarity is, is um, a relationship with a group or a struggle. Um, now, oftentimes out of solidarity can come really beautiful you know, ally relationships, but I think it's important to recognize the relationship between two, two people, two individuals, and the relationship between yourself and a larger struggle. Um, and uh, solidarity is not the same as an act against oppression. Um, we can organize marches against police brutality. Um, we can organize marches against stand your ground laws. Um, we can organize um, marches against uh, uh, the death penalty. These are all acts against oppression, because these are all oppressions, and they do disproportionately affect um, people of color. But when we organize for Trayvon, when we organize for Troy Davis, when we organize um, to, to free Angela, those are moments of solidarity. Th those, those are moments of solidarity. Um, uh, because that is connecting with a particular instance. That's, that's, that's making, um, I'm having trouble explaining this. Solidarity is such like a, a beautiful and abstract, transcendent, spiritual thing that it's oftentimes difficult to discuss it in, in uh, concrete language, but when you can take an individual instant of an oppression and, and make that feel universal to, to everyone involved, whether you're a person of color, whether you're white, whether you're a woman, whether you're a man, whether you're a child, whether you're elderly, whether you're cis male, whether you're um, uh, uh, trans female, whatever, it doesn't matter. Like that, that, Those are those true moments of solidarity and people can feel that. Um, and uh, I, in, in my opinion, I think solidarity is the truest expression of, of human love. And so I think that it's important for, for a movement like anarchism that accepts, um, or you know, looks at the outset as love as, as our primary principle, that solidarity has got to be the most important thing for, for our movements to succeed. So I hope that's not too much. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I also, 
I want this to be a little bit more. We have a few minutes left. I wish we had more time, but yeah. Um, so I just want to, um, I just want to say that I mean, just from some of the strategies you talked about implementing for um, white anarchists or white activists um, in recognizing the voices of people of color, um, I think that it's really important to do everything you can to make sure that recognizing those voices doesn't somehow mutate into tokenizing those voices. So when you say, for instance, seek out the people of color after the meeting and ask them what they thought about that meeting, don't turn that into something where you get to check off on your I'm not a racist bingo card this space that says, I talked to, to a person of color after this meeting. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's very important to do it from a place of, of, uh, of being genuine. Yeah, like I, I, I need people to come and ask me what I thought about it because I was there and I participated and not because I look the way that I look and, you know, mm -hmm. you want to yeah, you know, make yourself feel good about it. It's a, it's a very murky, uh, I mean, and I have to admit that I tried to put an entire like four to six week course into, you know, oh, half an hour. Oh, I'm not saying that you said to do that, yeah. but just, you know, being aware that right. that's yeah. not what it is. I mean, in this, I'm still thinking about a question that was asked um, in the back about, you know, well then how do we have more diversity in the room and have that actually be meaningful? And this piece on what you just described, uh, 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 your ending piece on solidarity, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that what you're sort of using as examples for solidarity can, can push toward this meaningful sort of sense of new kinds of relationships. Uh, and big parts of that are the new kinds of relationships with ourselves and the systems of power and structures of power that we are in and our disproportionate privileges and disadvantages within them. Um, what you describe, I think, can quite easily, if we're talking about then like the white anarchist community, if we want to try to define it as that, even though you acknowledged at the beginning that that's, you know, a white privilege lens that sees it that way, um, that what you use as examples can often be perhaps only this very first tier of, uh, of, a, of a, a first tier of solidarity action that can remain actually very superficial and sort of aggrandizing of white communities and white activists if it doesn't actually push toward uh, a sense of solidarity in which uh, uh, you are as uh, impacted, shaped, changed, morphed through the through meaningful relationship building, uh, as uh, as anyone. I don't know. I'm just trying to. I'm understanding. I, I I believe that I'm understanding why you were using the language that you were using often throughout this. But uh, as much as the way that you want to help and the voices that you want to hear and have in the room, that you know, if we coming from positions of white privilege. Uh, are not really working to be completely shattering our senses of privilege. Uh, that uh, you know, this this notion of solidarity can uh, can really actually remain very shallow and keep uh, keep all of this in these fairly parochial mm -hmm. and disjointed and us and them sorts of dynamics. I do think that's a major pitfall of like you know white anarchism. Um, but unless we're really pushing hard on unsettling this notion of solidarity, uh, I think that we're, you know, we're, we're always going to be in this tokenizing position. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I picked some examples that were, I think, overblown, um, just because they were examples I think, I, I, I assume that people in the room would know. Like, I think everyone knows who Trayvon Martin is, I think everyone knows who Troy Davis is, but these, these moments of solidarity don't have to be you know, marching in the streets. It can be something as simple as like writing a petition. It, it can be. It can be. Yeah. But I think you know sometimes the the work of activists is not always glamorous. You know, sometimes it really is nitty gritty stuff. If it's volunteering at um, doing childcare um, or, or working with a community of color that's trying to um, to set something up for childcare. If it's working at a, a free clinic. Or volunteering some hours at a free clinic, something like that. It doesn't have to be, these moments of solidarity don't have to be um, just these little blips 
of like highly publicized in the streets um, moments of solidarity, sometimes it's, it really is just interpersonal actions and small scale kinds of things. And I think it's important to move from those larger scale actions to the smaller scale interpersonal everyday kinds of things to really bridge uh, those communities and make it not about you know us and them, but deconstructing those separations. Yeah. Um, just a couple quick points. Um, first, and I imagine you would agree, I would be remiss if we left anarchist tactics to only like fighting with police. That I could do a lot more things than that. You know, just yeah, just yeah. for the record. Um, second, <laughs> with um, with someone like Tim Wise, for example, I think you know that he and people like him do great work. But I read an article once that that sort of raises the other side of it can be unfortunate if it comes across as like the champions of anti-racist work are white people. So mm -hmm. to look at both sides of, of the problematic nature of using white privilege for your own benefit. And then just the, the, the third thing is that um, when you're talking about white guilt and the idea that some people interpret these issues in a way that means like, well, I have this white privilege, therefore I'm helpless, there's nothing I can do about it, this is how I've sort of born into. And I, I'm just sort of curious to hear your thoughts about putting that issue alongside your definition of what a racist is, because it seems, in my experience, I've I've talked to white activists who um, have this understanding of being born into a white supremacist society and inculcating certain behavior, but then sort of responding by that and saying like when they screw up, saying, well, look, of course I'm going to screw up. So therefore, sort of using this idea that a white supremacist society breeds certain sorts of privileged behavior and saying, well, there's nothing I can do about it, that's the way that I've been inculcated and using it as, as sort of like a cop-out mm -hmm. and sort of having an understanding of like what it means to be racist without having certain sorts of benchmarks that people can do to actually try and get their way out of it as sort of like a, a helpful situation. So I'm just sort of curious your thoughts about that. There's an article um, actually out there called The Ladder, um, or the, I think it's called like The Ladder of <coughs> kind of Terms of White Privilege. I don't remember exactly, but um, but it, it kind of does set benchmarks. And what it, one of the things that it says is, this isn't a ladder in the sense that like all of these different stages of coming out of your mentality of white privilege um, uh, are permanent, rather, but just that there's an order, and people can jump from being you know up here on the ladder where you've very you've deconstructed white supremacy in your own mind and so on and so forth, but you can drop down to another level and go back up and forth like that. Um, but I think that, um, I think that you're, you're right. It, it can be paralyzing, it can be difficult without those benchmarks to, to kind of set goals for yourself on a personal level or even, even goals for your movement or your organizing group. Um, I'm not really sure what I can... Does anyone have any suggestions for a situation like that? He, he uh, raised his hand. Yeah, Jay, do you, do you want to say something? Did you want to say, I don't want to gloss well, over that point, though. Like, I want to come back to that. Well, part of it kind of made me build on what he said, that um, I'm really skeptical about the idea of using white privilege as a resource. Yeah. Uh, that To me, it sounds like use white supremacy to fight white supremacy. Yeah. Now, if we said use homophobia to fight homophobia, that w I think that sounds really, really mm -hmm. awful. And so uh, I'm just a little skeptical about that, but that also kind of brings in, um, you know, discussion about Tim Wise, for example. For all the good work Tim Wise do, he does take a lot of speaking engagements that could be offered to people of color, anti-racist activists, mm -hmm. whose, crit whose critique of white supremacy is, uh, in many cases, more articulate than his is. Don't get me wrong, he's a tremendously insightful guy, um, you know, but... Um, and so, so that 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 you know, I'm real, real skeptical about this kind of like utilitarian. You know, we use white supremacy to fight white supremacy, or use white privilege as a resource. Uh, right. It, it it doesn't sound right to me. Yeah. No. I mean, it's definitely very complicated, and it's something that that needs to be addressed. Um, I think that there are certain things that you can do using white supremacy against itself. But who is it that said we can't use the master's tools to unbuild the master's house? Okay. Is that Audrey? Yeah, Audrey Lord, right. There is truth to that as well. Um, I think, again, it's a murky, fine line. We're going to make mistakes um, when fighting racism. It's inevitable. And I think the point is to, to work through them and confront them. And definitely that's, that's a big issue that needs to be um, hashed out and taken apart. Can I restate it in a different way? Yeah. The, uh, the idea of using uh, white, white, white privilege or white supremacy to fight white supremacy sounds like 
giving voice to the voiceless, which uh, its main achievement will be perpetuating the voicelessness of those who are voiceless. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's, I think that's what, that doesn't ring right for me. Yeah, I, I mean, those are, those are the complications that we have to work through. I mean, you're right, you're absolutely right. Um, I don't have any uh, suggestions right off the bat, but if we, we as a group maybe want to tackle that one. The thing that I'll say is that I think it, um, it comes down to really interpersonal relationships, right? Like, so you get, so you can't be in solidarity with folks from the, from the peripheral. Like, you have to be in relationship, and I think it's important. And I think that a lot of those things will get worked out if you're if you're intentional about your interpersonal relationship. I mean, there is something to be said for the fact that, like, Tim Wise gets all these speaking engagements that, you know, why isn't the books speaking? Why isn't, you know, um, did you want to? Yeah, I just want to say, like, I think it points to the need to constantly question and push things further, right? So Tim Wise can say great stuff and bring good points, but okay, is he going to continue to push his analysis further to like, okay, how am I getting these speaking positions? How am I getting, where's this money going that I'm getting from these things? And to just it doesn't stop, like, anti-racism doesn't stop at some point, like, sweet, I got it, I'm done, you right. know, I've reached the top, the ladder doesn't end. No, it's important to recognize that it's a constant lifetime struggle, that racism and the conditions of racism change and evolve. I mean, James pointed out how racism came to be. Racism is not today what it was in, you know, 1760, right? Um, and it's important to recognize that. And so our strategies have to shift and adapt in response to the way white supremacy shifts and adapts and responds. Um, and it's going to be a constant lifetime struggle. We personally are going to have to constantly change. Our tactics and our movements are going to have to change. Um, so, I mean, this is not the end-all, be-all of, like, anti-racist organizing. These are just some tips and suggestions that, you know, I, I can't take a lifetime of work and put it into a half hour. So, But if it gets you on that, that road thinking about it, and I'm really grateful for JJ for bringing that up, that's a really complicated issue that you can go home with and tackle and bring to your movements and um, bring to your comrades of color and work through. Um, and I think that's important. I think it's an important aspect of it. Yeah, just one more thing on the Tim Wise part of the conversation. Um, you know, I think a lot of this stuff is both and. You know, this is a war that has to be front on, on, fought on multiple fronts and by multiple voices. And so one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of Tim Wise is that um, groups need their own to speak back to them, and you kind of alluded this, uh, alluded to this earlier. So I don't really mind the fact that Tim Wise gets mad engagements and what have you. I'm good with that because that's somebody I want to have heard, you know, in those various communities. I'm glad he does get those engagements. It's not to say that the other writers of color, folk of color, that do this. I can use a paycheck myself and my father and I do a lot of this type of training, all right? We have trouble getting the contracts with school districts and so forth and so on. So we could use a couple more engagements. However, that doesn't make me mad at Tim because I need somebody like Tim out there on the front lines getting into those spaces where maybe I'm not going to get into, you know, and, and doing that. So I think that's a both and. While Tim does it, you know, in the spaces where he's able to get into, those of us in this room need to get into. I can't walk into an anarchist con uh, convention, so to speak, with enough with enough cred mm -hmm. as some of you all will be able to do. So you know, having them, it's, it's good to come and talk about the ways in which the anarchist movement needs to tighten up on this matter of race. But I can't go to the main convention and, and bring the same cred that you would. You know, so we need to figure out. Each of us needs to get into the spaces that we can get into and bring some truth. Some of us going to get more opportunities, some of us less. So, so I like the fact that Tim is out there on the front line. He's getting more contracts, he's getting more gigs, but good. At least somebody legitimate getting those contracts as opposed to somebody knuckleheaded getting those contracts. You know, all of us have to find out where we can get heard, where we can get some movement going. All right, James, you want to? Yeah, I just thought it'd be like a cool homework thing, maybe, for after this little talk would be to read, watch, or listen to something about a POC movement or struggle or history that you know little or nothing about, 
and then if you want to talk about anything we discussed or share reading and watching and listening lists, I put our email addresses up here so that this can be an ongoing conversation. Um, and I, I encourage all of you to like, take contacts with the other people who came and like start little mini reading groups. Like, hey, we're all going to read about this thing uh, about I don't Quanju that you know we don't know anything about it. Let's check it out and see what it is or. Um, you know, about what, what have you. Because, I mean, there's so much uh, history out there and so much of it is so useful and you can get so much out of it. But um, I think everyone, but especially in anarchism, we like operate in these little bubbles of history. Where it's like, I know everything there is to know about Haymarket and the Spanish Revolution, <laughs> but like, ask me about the Civil Rights Movement and like, I have the equivalent of, you know, someone who learned about it in middle school. You know, you, you can... We have so much more we can expand on um, for talking about this stuff. Actually, thanks for touching on the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement had a tactic for getting people involved. Sorry. And I forget exactly what they called it, but it was like a, a teach one sort of method where you teach someone about the struggle, and then that person goes off and teaches someone about the struggle, and then that person goes off. And you only have to do it once. And I think that's really <laughs> important for the white community to, to organize against racism in that I think that's a, a tactic that can be really useful. So if you take some of the ideas that, that you're, you're using now and that you've learned about and that you're working through and you, you take that to one person, one comrade, then, and then that comrade takes that to another comrade and then that comrade takes it to another comrade, that's a way that the white community can um, effectively organize and start to work through um, the pathology of, of white supremacy. And deconstructed. So, I hope that's useful. Thank you. I think so.